On August 26th, 1973, test pilot Charles Red Janice was flying high over California. Wing mirrors fully extended, hand on the steering wheel, and the sun glinting off his blue oval badge. Because Red was flying a Ford Pinto. Just moments earlier, Janice had pushed the Pinto to 65 miles an hour on a short runway. With the wings and a push engine from a Cessna helping him along, it took off. And there he was, high above Camarillo, California, a Ford Pinto with the wings of a plane. It wasn't pretty, but it was almost one of the most important moments in car aviation history, until it all went horrifically, tragically wrong. But let's start at the beginning of the story, the story of the AVE Mizar flying car. The Mizar was the brainchild of AVE, Advanced Vehicle Engineering. Based in Van Nuys, California, AVE was founded in 1971 by Henry Smolinski and Harold Blake. Their goal? Create a flying car. Because why not, right? Smolinski was an aerospace engineer. He had studied at the Northrop Institute of Technology and then worked as a structural engineer for North American Aviation. His job was jet engine and aircraft design. He then joined Rocketdyne. Yes, that Rocketdyne, the one whose work in missile development and aerospace quite literally got us into space. And Smolinski was part of those programs. In other words, Henry Smolinski knew what he was doing. He had a distinguished career. He was competent. He looked like a high school science teacher who enjoyed Hungry Man TV dinners and a reasonable bedtime. So why chase the wild dream of a flying car? Well, because despite many attempts from brilliant minds before him, it was just something that hadn't been achieved yet. Setting aside the fact that helicopters exist, many had tried to craft the perfect personal flying vehicle before this, something that could work on the ground and in the air. It just never happened. But Henry Smolinski and Harold Blake had an idea of how it could. They just needed the right car. Built to run and run and run. Pinto, a little better idea at your Ford dealer. Earlier that decade in 1970, the Ford Motor Company unveiled its newest pride and joy the Pinto. It was described as friendly and affordable. Ford needed to be competitive with the flood of compact Japanese cars, so Ford President Lee Iacocca issued a mandate. Make a car less than 2,000 pounds that cost under $2,000. Different times. The Ford Motor Company gave us this. This was their answer. Apathy on four wheels. If it were a Disney character, every line of dialogue would be a sigh. And the Pinto didn't have the best reputation when it came to the road, either. The design of its fuel tank meant that it would rupture if the car was rear-ended, and several publicized fiery crashes had already begun to affect Pinto sales. <laughs> Luckily, the risk of getting rear-ended in the air is fairly low. But there were several other reasons Smolinski and Blake chose this car. Despite the flaws, the Ford Pinto did achieve its goal of being lightweight. And when you're trying to get off the ground, every pound counts. The Pinto was also cheap enough to be a viable test vehicle, a perfect choice to form an unholy union with an airplane. Now, they just needed that airplane. So enter the Cessna Skymaster. The twin-engine aircraft was produced in America from 1962 to 1982, and AVE chopped out the cabin in the front engine, left the wings in the pusher engine, and then the Pinto was backed into the airframe. Then, four high-strength self-locking pins were used to secure the airplane to the car. The ease of connecting and disconnecting the car was a big design consideration. So there you have it. That's it the Advanced Vehicle Engineering Company's beloved Mizar. Sometimes the best approach is the simplest, I guess. The Mizar was still a fully functioning car, just with a powered glider backpack on. It wasn't meant to drive around with its wings and tail folded in somehow, cause you know, that'd be ridiculous. The Mizar used both the car's motor and the small pusher engine to achieve a 500 foot takeoff, while the Cessna Skymaster itself needed between 800 and 1500 feet. And then during landing, the car's brakes along with the wing flaps would allow for a shorter landing than the Cessna, also around 500 feet. So the Mizar was better at being a plane than the plane it was based on. It was designed to reach airspeeds of 130 to 150 miles per hour, also about the same as the average Cessna. They usually cruise at 144 miles an hour, top out at 199. Once in the air, the Mizar was controlled as if you were driving through the clouds. The ailerons were controlled by turning the steering wheel right or left. The elevator by pushing the wheel back and forth. 
The dashboard had flight instruments that would make even the most loyal Microsoft Flight Simulator fans jealous. All of the flight controls in the car were attached to the airframe with connections on the car's underside. In total, the Mizar had a projected range of 1,000 miles before refueling. Henry Smolinski envisioned this as the airplane of the people, with a price of roughly $15,000 to $18,000, or around $115,000 now. You would no longer need to travel across crowded highways, just drive to your local airport, connect the car to the plane, and fly. It was that simple. And then you would land, unhook those self-locking pins, and drive your car away as normal. Return and reattach the wings, and then you're flying back home. At press conferences, Smolinski emphasized the focus on ease of use, bragging that it was so easy, quote, even a woman could do it alone. Yeah, he said that. He was a sexist, not us. This was 1973, after all. Women were still one year away from being allowed to get credit cards on their own. But back to that first test flight. Henry Smolinski and Harold Blake had achieved something great. The flying car had been invented in a way that brought flight to the masses. Now, they just needed test pilot Charles Janice to land safely. Janice was just a few seconds into his test flight when things went wrong. The right wing mounting had come undone right after takeoff. Janice had to land and land now. With his experience, Red knew that he had to land somewhere in the direction he was currently pointing because any attempt to turn the plane would end it all. Luckily, Red and the Mizar weren't heading out into the ocean. Spotting a bean field straight ahead, Red brought the Pinto down and managed to land safely. He was alive. With a police escort, he drove the car, wings still attached, back to the airport. On some level, we can call that a success. Except, of course, the NTSB came out to investigate the incident, and investigators found that the Mizar didn't exactly have the design integrity of Smolinski's more high-profile projects. The airframe was just overburdened. Beyond that, it was poorly built. Bad welds, loose parts, common sheet metal screws were used to connect the wing struts. And even with the lightweight Pinto as the main body, it was still way too heavy. But as far as AVE was concerned, that didn't matter. Promotional footage of the test flight had already been made. That publicity train was rolling. And it was time for all of us to take to the skies, Home Depot hardware and all. Smolinski and Blake were ready to make more prototypes. Galpin Ford in North Hills, California signed on as a distributor and they immediately had 34 pre-orders from flight thirsty consumers. And the Mizar even got a movie deal. Specifically, the next James Bond movie, The Man with the Golden Gun. Things were going so well that AVE couldn't let Red's little crash landing raise any eyebrows. They needed an undeniably successful test flight. That flight was scheduled for September 11th, 1973. Bad sign. And there was another problem. Good old Red Janice wasn't available. He said he was busy that day. Hmm. But this was the flying car of the people, right? What better way to showcase the versatility of the Mizar than to have some non-veteran pilots take to the skies? So Henry Smolinski and Harold Blake decided to fly it themselves. But they had made one more change to the car. They added a bigger engine, a 300 horsepower Lycoming engine, which was also heavier. Smolinski and Blake got the craft airborne despite not signaling the airport's tower or having fixed any of the structural issues from the previous flight. Some witnesses claimed that the Mizar was in the air for more than two minutes. Others said it reached an altitude of 800 feet, but however long it was in the sky, the flight went wrong very quickly. In a newspaper report about that day, air traffic controller Reed Wesk said that the wings started to buckle around 400 feet in the air, presumably strained by the weight and power of the new engine. Our brave duo then made a right turn, the same turn Charles Janice knew not to make, and the aircraft started to disintegrate midair. It tumbled toward the ground, striking a tree before landing on a parked pickup truck. Like the earthbound Ford Pintos, the Mizar exploded upon impact, and Henry Smolinski and Harold Blake died instantly. It was all over. Advanced vehicle engineering, the production of the Mizar, the dream of Henry Smolinski was gone. So why did Smolinski and Blake create this flying car? They wanted to change the world. They wanted to give us all a chance to fly, improve our lives in the process. It was a big dream, and it came to a tragic end. Since then, though, the idea of flying cars or personalized aircraft hasn't exactly vanished. Concepts from startups and automakers alike are in the news more than ever. Big companies like Toyota, Mercedes, and Hyundai are all pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into developing new prototypes, some more fully baked than others. 
But there's a big difference between these and the Pinto. Now we're trying to copy drones, not planes. Borrowing a phrase from the military, now companies call them VTOL aircraft, vertical takeoff and landing. And as electric powertrains have matured as a technology, it does seem more realistic to imagine today than when the Mizar took to the skies 50 years ago. Note, I say more realistic. There's still one big issue standing between us and an everyday flying car. And that is that flying cars, however you define them, are a solution in search of a problem. A problem that things like helicopters have already solved. I think it's a fair assumption that the real motivation here is automakers looking to recoup their investments into battery and electric motor development however they can. So while improving infrastructure and transportation is an important goal, one that has pushed us to develop incredible machines and technologies, fact is that roads, trains, subways, walkable cities, and better vehicles will just have to do, at least for now. Maybe one day, the dream of Henry Smolinski and Harold Blake can take flight again. What do you think though? Are flying cars total bullshit, or is there a good reason to keep pushing the boundaries and trying to make them a reality? Let us know in the comments. And as always, I'll be back in two weeks with the next one. Thanks for watching.